Hello everyone, we're going to work today on electrolysis. This is part of Cambridge IGCSE chemistry for the 2023 new syllabus. If you're using my textbook, the complete notes for IGCSE chemistry, electrolysis is on page 40, that is chapter 10. The textbook contains all the notes you'll need to understand electrolysis very well. In addition, you will have diagrams that makes it very easy for you to predict the products of electrolysis. We're also going to be solving exam questions. So I have this classified questions taken from the exam papers, and we'll be solving questions related to today's topic, electrolysis. Let's start by defining what electrolysis is. Electrolysis is simply when we take an ionic compound, like table salt, for instance, and we apply electricity to it. Now, when we do electrolysis, we have an issue here because ionic compounds do not conduct electricity. Like we take crystals of salt and you try to pass electricity through it, you realize that there is no voltage. The electricity doesn't pass through solid ionic compounds. So for us to do electrolysis of ionic compounds, we're going to have to do something. We're going to have either to take the ionic compound, melt that ionic compound, because then the ions will be free to move. The other option is to take the ionic compound and dissolve it in water. So the definition of electrolysis is going to be like the following. It's when we melt or dissolve ionic compound and then we pass electricity through it. Once this is done, the ionic compound will be split into positive and negative ions. Why is it that ionic compounds do not conduct electricity when solids? Well, I take any solid ionic compound like the one I have here, you'll find that the voltage or the electricity doesn't pass through. However, if I take molten, or if I take dissolved ionic compound, you realize that the electricity passes, and you can see that the light bulb is shining. Now, this has to do with the structure of the ionic compound. We took this in the lesson of ionic bonding, and we saw at that time that ions are fixed in their own position in this solid crystal of the ionic compound. Now, once we melt or dissolve the ionic compound, you realize something. You realize that the ions would start to move freely. This is the time when we could do electrolysis of ionic compound, which is simply to separate those positive ions and the negative ions. Throughout the lesson, we'll be solving some problems like the one you have in front of you. So in this problem, we'll try to determine if the substance conducts or doesn't conduct electricity. So it'd be better if you could pause the screen and try to solve these problems problems. So let's start with graphite. Graphite is well known as a form of carbon that conducts electricity because it has free electrons. Diamond is the opposite. Diamond doesn't have free electrons. Sulfuric acid and every other acid has free mobile ions, so that is a good conductor of electricity. And so is water. Water can conduct electricity because it has positive hydrogen ions and negative hydroxyl ions. I have molten ionic compound, and that's what we were talking about. We said that molten ionic compounds do conduct electricity very well. Even dissolved ionic compounds, when it says aqueous, this means that the ionic compound has been dissolved in water. Here I have an ACL and it says here that it's solid S, so that means it doesn't conduct electricity. When it says aqueous, that means it does conduct. And when it says NaCl and is an L for liquid, that means it's molten ionic compound and it does conduct electricity. To do electrolysis, you'll need a cell like the one you have in front of you. So we start by having some ionic compound, either molten or dissolved, and then we're going to take electrodes. These electrodes are usually made up of either graphite or platinum. Now, why do we use those two substances? First of all, both substances are good conductors of electricity. Second, they are both quite unreactive. So they wouldn't react with the ionic compound and interfere in the products of electrolysis. So I'll take those electrodes and I'll put them into the ionic compound. So in my case, these are graphite electrodes. And I'll connect those electrodes to a battery through wires. Now, once we connect them to the battery, one of those electrodes will become positive and the other one is negative. So in my case here, the one closer to the battery is the negative electrode. And we call that negative electrode, we call it a cathode. So the cathode is the negative electrode and the anode is the one that is positive. So again, in every electrolysis, you're going to have to have two electrodes. One of them is the positive, we call it the anode, and the other one we call it the cathode, which is the negative electrode. Now, 
Once we turn on the electricity, you realize that something happened. We realize that the ions would start to move to the positive and the negative electrode. So now that the ions are free to move, you will see that the positive ions, in my case, I have sodium ions, those will migrate to the cathode and the negative ions, in my case, their chloride, will go to the positive ion. Just because the opposite charges attract. What's going to happen to those ions as they move to the opposite electrode? For the sodium ion, which is positive, it will gain electrons from the cathode, while the chloride ions are going to lose electrons to the anode. Let me remind you about redox. When an ion like sodium gains an electron, then that's what we call reduction. And when an ion like chloride loses electron, then that's what we call oxidation. During electrolysis, the positive ions get attracted to the cathode, and that's where reduction takes place. And during electrolysis as well, the negative ions or the anions, those are the ones that get attracted to the anode, and that's where loss of electrons or oxidation takes place. Let's label the different parts of the electrolysis cell. So let's start by labeling the electrodes. Remember, the positive electrode is what we call the anode, while the negative one is what we call the cathode. So I'm just going to put the labels now. The cathode is going to be B, while the anode is going to be A. The solution or the molten ionic compound is what we call the electrolyte, that is E. Finally, I'm going to put the labels of the processes. So I have two processes that take place during electrolysis. One is reduction, reduction as red cat, so it's going to be the cathode, and ox, which is going to be the oxidation for the anode. So I'm just going to put those processes where they belong. So it's going to be anox, which stands for anode for oxidation, and red cat, that is cathode for reduction. We'll take an example about the electrolysis of a molten ionic compound. In my case, it is lead bromide. Now, uh, we will start by taking a crucible that contains the solid ionic compound lead bromide, and we're going to try to see whether there is any electricity passing through this circuit. Now, we've seen earlier that if the ionic compound is in a solid form, you realize that there is no electricity. But as we apply heat from a Bunsen burner, you will notice that the electricity starts to pass through this molten ionic compound. So once again, if your ionic compound is solid, you will notice that there is no electricity whatsoever. So the voltage reading will just be zero when the ionic compound is still solid. But as you melt the ionic compound, like when you turn on the Bunsen burner and you melt the ionic compound, you will notice that you start to see the voltage reading and you would notice some observations. So what observations you would expect to see as you do the electrolysis of molten lead bromide? Now, at the cathode, that's where we expect the metal ions to get reduced. You would notice that the lead metal forms there at the cathode. So there will be some silvery deposits of lead at the cathode. And the anode, this is where we would notice that there is a brown gas. This brown gas, it's actually the bromide ions getting oxidized to form bromine gas. Let's explain these observations from the electrolysis of lead bromide. Now, remember, at the positive, which is the anode, that's where we expect the oxidation to take place. So I'll write the formula of the equation, that's bromide ions. This came from the lead bromide. So what is going to happen here? The bromide ions are going to lose electrons. That's what oxidation is all about. So it's going to form Br2. That's bromine gas or bromine, the element. And we're going to also lose electrons. So we're going to lose an electron here, but then when we balance the equation, I have to balance the equation because bromine only exists as Br2, then I'm going to have to put 2 here at the beginning, and I have to balance the charges because right now I have two negative charges with this 2 I put at the beginning, so they're going to have to put two electrons there in front of the electron. What about the cathode? The cathode, this is where the lead metal deposits. So I'm going to write the formula of lead. Lead is Pb. Now, lead ions have a charge of 2, so Pb2+. plus. It's going to gain electrons. Why is it going to gain electrons? Because lead is going to get reduced. Always, always reduction takes place at the cathode. And then we're going to form the element lead. That's lead metal. That explains the silvery deposits that form there at the cathode. Try to do this by yourself. Try to differentiate between the products at the cathode and the products at the anode in each case. Let's remember that the positive electrode is the anode, and an anode is called an anode because that's where anions get attracted to. Oxidation also takes place at the anode. Lead is a metal. Lead 
Ions are positive, so it's gonna get attracted to the cathode. Aluminium is another metal. Bromine is a non-metal, and a non-metal always has negative ions. It's gonna get attracted to the positive anode. Reduction takes place at the cathode, and cations get attracted there to the cathode. That's where the word cathode came from. And hydrogen also forms positive ions, so it should also get attracted to the cathode. We're gonna practice a question related to electrolysis. So the first part of the question, they're asking us here to define what electrolysis is. So what's the definition of electrolysis for two marks? I'll start by saying here that it is the breaking down of ionic compound, but they're gonna have to specify what type of ionic compounds are the ones that get electrolyzed. It's gonna have to be molten or dissolved ionic. Then it says here, name a substance that can be used as inert electrode. The word inert means that it's unreactive. So I'm gonna tell them it could be either platinum or graphite. Then it says write an ionic half equation for the reaction which hydrogen is produced. So they want me to produce hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is H2. Hydrogen only exists in this diatomic molecule. And they want me to form this hydrogen molecule starting from a hydrogen ion. So how am I supposed to write it? As I show you here, I'm writing the equation starting with the H2 as the product, and then I'm gonna write the hydrogen ion in this case. How am I supposed to balance the equation? So since I have H2 there on the right, I'm just gonna put two in front of the H plus, and then I'm gonna have to balance the charges. So I'm just gonna have to put two electrons right after the hydrogen ion. So now I have the hydrogen atoms balanced, and I have the charges, positive and negative, balanced. It says here, where is hydrogen produced in the electrolytic cell? Now, since it's positive, then you would expect it to be formed right there at the cathode. So I'm just going to tell them it's going to be the cathode where the hydrogen is going to form. For the last part of this question, they want me to turn this word equation given here, they want me to turn this into a formula equation. So what am I supposed to do? I'm just going to convert that sodium chloride in words. I'm just going to convert it into a formula. So let's write it here. So I have NaCl for sodium chloride, water, then I am producing here, I'm producing sodium hydroxide, NaOH, and hydrogen is a gas, and chlorine as well. Now, to score two marks, you really need to balance it. So take a look at the chlorine on the right-hand side. There is two chlorine atoms here, so I'm just going to have to put two in front of the NaCl. Now I have two sodiums on the left. I'm going to have to make them two there on the right. Then I still have to do one last little thing, because right now I have two oxygens here on the right, and I only have one oxygen there on the left. So I'm just going to put two here and then everything becomes balanced. One application of electrolysis is the extraction of aluminium. Now, aluminium is quite very useful because it's widely used almost in everything we have in our houses. To extract aluminium, we need to somehow melt the rock that contains the aluminium ions. This rock or ore is known as bauxite. To do so, we need to melt this bauxite at a lower melting point than the one that it has here. So like the melting point of bauxite is 2050 and that will take so much heat and effort and money to melt this Bioxide. So scientists thought about another compound of aluminium, which is known as cryolite. By melting this compound, that would help us to dissolve the bioxide and reduce its melting point from 2000 degrees all the way down to almost 900 degrees Celsius. So that would help us to save a lot of electricity and money trying to extract the aluminium. So again, the whole purpose of the cryolite is to reduce the melting point increase the conductivity because we're adding extra ions here and above all that would also help us to reduce the energy cost while extracting the aluminium. One application of electrolysis is the extraction of aluminium. To do so we need to get the ore of aluminium which is the bauxite and put it into this furnace and we also add the cryolite to reduce its melting point. As we turn on the electricity you would start to see observations. The first thing you'll notice that there is aluminium metal forming there at the bottom side, and you'll see bubbles of oxygen forming at the anode. Now, both the cathode and anode are made up of graphite because it is inert. So at the cathode, the aluminium is gonna gain electrons, that is reduction, so it's gonna gain three electrons to form aluminium atoms, and at the anode, you'll notice that oxide ions getting oxidized into oxygen molecules. You need to balance the equation, you put there two on the left-hand side, and you also have four negative charges there on the left, so you're gonna have to put four electrons 
electrons there on the right. The overall chemistry happening here is that the aluminium ions, those are the positive ions, they travel all the way to the bottom. This is where they get reduced and you would form the aluminium metal there at the bottom side and the molten aluminium will be poured from the bottom side while the oxide ions, they will get to the anodes, they will lose electrons to form oxygen. Something happens while this oxidation happening there at the anode. When oxygen forms at the anode, it actually reacts with the anode. The anode is made up of graphite. So you have oxygen and carbon from the graphite. Those two react to form carbon dioxide. Now, this causes the burning of the anode. So while this is happening, you would notice some black smoke forming at the anode. This is because the graphite is getting burnt. So this is why we need to replace those anodes every now and then because they burn in oxygen. You have a list of problems that take place during the extraction of aluminium. And you do have the solutions there in yellow. So try to match each one of those issues with its solution. So let's start with the one on top. It says cryolite is mixed with bauxite. The reason why we mix the cryolite with bauxite is because we want to lower the melting point of the bauxite. It says here anodes are changed regularly. The reason why we change the anodes regularly because they actually burn in oxygen during the oxidation of oxide ions. Then it says bauxite is melted. The reason why we melt the bauxite because we want to conduct electricity. Cathodes are placed at the bottom. The reason because we want to collect the aluminium. Aluminium is a metal. It has high density, so it needs to be collected at the bottom of the container. Carbon dioxide forms at the anode. That's because oxygen, during the electrolysis, reacts with the graphite in the anodes. Finally, it says fluorine gas produced at the anode. That's because of the fluoride ions that are found in the cryolite. We're going to solve a question worth five marks about the extraction of aluminium. So the first thing it says here, describe how aluminium is extracted from its ore, include ionic equation for the reaction. So I start by writing the main point. I say bauxite is first dissolved in molten cryolite. And then it says this helps to lower the melting point. Then it says aluminium forms at the cathode, or you can say either way, you can say oxygen forms at the anode. And then we're going to write the ionic equation. So I'm going to write the ionic equation first at the anode. We wrote that previously, so it's going to write O2 negative, becoming oxygen molecule. And then we balance the equation. And then I'm going to write the equation for the cathode. That's when aluminium, 3 plus, getting reduced to form aluminium metal. Then it says, explain why the anodes have to be replaced regularly. That's because Oxygen from the electrolysis reacts with the anodes. The anodes are made up of carbon, graphite, and that's why they're going to have to be replaced. We're halfway through the electrolysis. We still have the other part about the electrolysis of aqueous compounds. So if you want to look at the other part of this lesson, including the notes, the classified exam questions, and videos to cover the entire syllabus, you can get to my website. I'm leaving a link in the description. There you can find solved exam exam questions, videos to cover the entire syllabus, and notes updated for the 2023 syllabus.